we're taking a look at the first half of the season, and then we're looking at the rest of the season with Ed Valentine of Big Blue View. That's coming up next on the Locked on Giants podcast. You are Locked on Giants, your daily New York Giants podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. This episode of the Locked on Giants podcast is brought to you by BetterHelp. Give online therapy a try at betterhelp.com slash locked on and get on your way to being your best self. Hello, New York Giant fans, and welcome to another edition of the Locked on Giants podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast family, your team every day. My name is Patricia Trana. Thank you so much for making us your first listen of the day or for watching on YouTube, your first watch of the day. And uh, some of you folks asked for it. You got it. Joining me on today's show is Ed Valentine of Big Blue View. So those of you who requested Ed, he is here. We're going to talk Giants. Edward, always glad to have you on the show. Oh, thanks for having me, Patty. So so, so you're saying people love me? Believe it or not, Ed. I mean, I couldn't believe it either, but yes, people yeah. do love you. I had, a, I had several people <laughs> say, have Ed Valentine on during the bye week. We couldn't do it last week, but here you are. Uh, oh, actually, right. we're bumping Twitter Tuesday for for wow. you. That's that that's how big this is. So Twitter wow. Tuesday, by the way, well, Twitter I, Tuesday, by the way, will be on Thursday, folks. Or I'm not I, on a Thursday later in the week. I'm sorry. I, I better bring it then. You better bring it. All right. Otherwise, otherwise, <laughs> I, I might not be able to talk to you anymore. <laughs> uh, that's going to be hard since we sit next to each other during these during these games, Patty. I know, I know. Well, Ed, <laughs> let's get into uh, the Giants. They're back from the bye week. Um, as as this show is airing, it is a Tuesday. Uh, they're back from the bye week. Um, six and two. Are you surprised at this team and where they're at? Oh, absolutely, Patty. Nobody saw six and two coming. I mean, this is a team that that is at the beginning of building a roster. It's at the beginning of Joe Shane's time as GM. It's at the beginning of Brian Dable's time as head coach. But what it, what, what this has shown you is really what outstanding coaching, not only from Brian Dable, but from Wink Martindale, from the position coaches, from Mike Kafka, what outstanding coaching and preparation can do for a football team. And, and I also think that maybe it's showing us that that perhaps this team is not quite as bereft of talent as we might have thought after watching it for the last two years. So it it really is just amazing what can happen when when coaches believe in players, when players believe in coaches, when teams play with discipline, when they do small things well and and they do and they simply do things like like don't turn the football over consistently it really is amazing because the margin for error between good and bad teams is just so small it is and you know coming into this season we figured okay it would be an evaluation period for the coaches and for the gm um, to find out what they had on the roster. But, you know, really, a lot of people, I think, sold this roster short because they did have some key pieces that have stepped up and performed for this team. You know, these the uh, Andrew Thomas's Saquon has bounced back. Daniel Jones has looked okay. Um, you know, they, on the defensive side, Leonard Williams, Dexter Lawrence, Xavier McKinney, who – um, as we were sitting down to record this, we got the unfortunate news about his hand injury that's going to keep him out a few weeks. But um, th like you said, this roster had some pieces that they, you know, could start with. Yes, it did. And and what we're finding, Patty, is, you know, during the bye week, Joe Sheen talking about extending certain players. I mean, we always knew that that there would be decisions to be made about Daniel Jones and, and Saquon Barkley, but the names Andrew Thomas, um, McKinney's name came up, 
Dexter Lawrence's name came up. Julian Love's name came up as a, as a guy that might get a contract extension. And, and what it tells you is that there's a core in place, or at least hopefully in place, that the Giants think they can go forward with. And that is not something that's been there for a while. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the, the Giants, Joe Shane coming in, inheriting a really bad cap situation, makes you wonder now if he had had a decent cap situation, how much even further along this team might have been. Absolutely, Patty. And Joe has admitted several times that through free agency, he did not chase maybe the the caliber of player that he might have liked to have chased. They signed a lot of guys to the one-year veteran salary benefit type contracts that the John Felicianos of the world that they added to this team. I think the biggest contract they gave out was Mark, Mark Lewinsky's three-year $18 million deal. But a lot of it was you know, one-year guys, guys that could get them through, not necessarily guys that they looked at and said, you know, he's the long-term guy that we want to build around to play tight end or to be our center for the next four or five years or or to be, you know, one of our starting defensive backs for the next four or five years. He's a guy that can help us get through 2022 as we build this roster. And going into 2023, I don't, I don't want to see – Joe starts spending money like crazy. That is not the way to build a roster. But if he sees a player who, for example, he thinks can be a starting center for the next four years or, or so and, and, and anchor that offensive line, he's in a situation where he can go and try to get that guy and not have to say, well, I just have to sit this one out because I just don't have the resources to make it happen. Yeah. Now one guy, I think who, who he's going to uh, give a new contract to, and you know, granted there's nine more games to go. So anything could happen, but one guy who's definitely trending towards a new contract, Saquon Barkley, that's going to be a tricky contract. I think for them to, to come to a, an agreement because you don't want to get Barkley the top of the line dollars. At the same time, you don't want to undercut him. What do you think is going to happen with that? If you had to take a guess as to what the Giants are going to do there with Barkley, do you think maybe they try and franchise tag him? Do you think they try and sign him to a deal? I mean, what, what do you anticipate? Well, I think, Patty, I think there has to be a discussion. They have to try and sign him. They can't just walk away from Saquon Barkley at this point. That's He's too good of a player. I mean, he has shown this year that, that we all wondered, was he still 2018 Saquon Barkley? Could he still be that guy? And I can make an argument when you watch him run that maybe he's better now than he was in 2018. Maybe he's more – maybe he's – a guy that gets north and south a little bit more. Maybe he's a guy that lowers his shoulder a little bit more and pushes a pile. And, and he hates that question. He hates the north and south question. I've asked it. I know. <laughs> so, but, uh, but, but all of that athleticism is still there. So if you're the Giants, you have to talk to him. But you can't tie yourself to a contract where you're guaranteed where it's a fully guaranteed contract where you're giving him a deal that you can't get out of for the next four or five years, whatever you do, you have to structure a deal. You know, however you front load it, however you do it, you have to structure a deal. Maybe it's a four year deal, but you have to do something to get out, to be able to get out of this deal two years down the road, or at least three years down the road. You can't tie yourself to a guy because Saquon's never going to be better than he is now. The more he carries the ball, the more the Giants use him, the more tread gets on his tires. We see what happens to running backs. They don't get better 
than they were in their first contracts. They just don't. So this is the best we're ever going to see from Saquon. You just can't be tied to him for four or five years. So the, the question for me is what's the dollar figure? And, and what I have consistently said is you've got to look at the average annual value for Alvin Kamara and for Ezekiel Elliott because Saquon's a better player than either one of them. Right. He's not going to take less than what those two guys are making. I'm sorry, he's just not. And I think that's $15 million a year. He's not going to take less than that. So it's a very difficult, very tricky negotiation. Nobody wants to see it come to the franchise tag. But I wouldn't I wouldn't be shocked if it if it does, because I just I don't I don't see an easy deal to be made. No, it's not going to be an easy deal. And I mean, if nothing else, they'll use the franchise tag to to buy them more time. And I think mm-hmm. what will probably happen if they decide they're going to re-sign Daniel Jones, and that's up in the air. We'll talk about him in just a second. You look to get Daniel Jones done before the start of free, or, or at least before you have to assign the franchise tag. This way you free up that franchise tag. I think Daniel Jones's contract is going to be a little bit easier to do if the Giants decide to re-sign Daniel Jones. Now a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. Life can be challenging and put a strain on our mental health when things happen beyond our control. Seeking the expertise of a licensed professional to help guide us towards a resolution is key to overcoming life's ups and downs. So if you're thinking of giving therapy a try, BetterHelp is a great option. It's convenient, accessible, affordable, and entirely online. Get matched with a therapist after filling out a brief survey. And if you find that you're not a match to your assigned therapist, you can switch at any time for free. Visit betterhelp.com slash locked on today to get 10% off your first month. Again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P.com slash locked on. Let's talk about Daniel. Has he done enough so far, Ed, to say quarterback doesn't have to be a need next year? Just roll with him, you know, another year or two. Well, Patty, if you're making that decision today, the answer is yes. But there are nine games to play. Okay. We don't know what's going to happen over those nine games. So all of that has to factor in what happens the second half of the season. You, does he revert to some of the bad habits, to some of the turnover-prone issues that he's had in the past? But I think we're seeing more this year of what Daniel Jones really is, more of the player that, that he's capable of being. Now, he's not capable. He's not ever going to be Patrick Mahomes. He's not going to be Josh Allen. He's not going to be a top five in the league quarterback. But he can do some things. He can use his legs. He's been very smart with his decisions so far this year. He's been, he's showing a lot of toughness and leadership. And what has he got? Five game winning drives that he's led this year. He, as Joe Shane has said, he has made plays. He has shown up when the Giants needed him to show up. And I think that's a big part of what you ask a quarterback to do. So for me, If this continues, then you absolutely have to look at Daniel Jones and and bring him back. Now, you don't give him, again, like Saquon, you don't give him a five-year deal. You you give him a two-year deal. And the fact of the matter is, I don't think anybody's going to be banging down the door trying to steal Daniel Jones away from you and offering him a mega contract I think you can probably get Daniel Jones on something like a two-year, $35 million deal. And I think I would absolutely do something like that while you build out the rest of the roster, Patty. Yeah, that roster definitely has some holes. And then the other thing you got to take into consideration for everybody who says, oh, go and get another quarterback is where are they going to be drafting? We don't know. If they continue to win, they're going to be drafting down in the 20s, you know, maybe even lower, depending on where they end up uh, if they make the playoffs. So it's going to be hard 
for Shane to jump up to get a quality quarterback. And, you know, this, th there are going to be other quarterbacks coming out. So, um, you know, it's, it, it's going to be difficult, I think, to, and, mm -hmm. and where they end up drafting and whatnot. Uh, that's how I see it kind of playing mm -hmm. out. The question is, Patty, are you in a place as a franchise where you're either desperate enough that you, no matter what your circumstance is, you absolutely have to go get that quarterback, or are you, you know, or are you in a place where you are good enough where you can afford to give up some of that draft capital, where you can do the the Los Angeles Rams thing that they've done for a few years that got them to the Super Bowl, where they said, you know. Fooey on the draft picks. We're just going to go collect some players and make a run here. I don't think the Giants are there yet. Yeah. Give the, give Joe Shane a couple of years maybe to continue building this roster, and then maybe you'll be in that place. We'll have to see. But it, it's an interesting decision. But if I'm making it today, Patty, I'm going forward with Jones. Yeah, I probably am too, as of today, of course. But mm -hmm. nine games still to go. All right, Ed, let's talk, if we could, about uh, the bigger picture right now. The Giants' offense, the passing offense, I think twice this year has thrown for over 200 yards and just barely at that. They've relied on the, the legs of Saquon Barkley and Daniel Jones, and we saw, you know, against the Seahawks, they took that away. And the Giants, now granted, they had the turnovers, which didn't help, but the Giants just couldn't really get things done. So that said, I mean, can this Giants team sustain winning on the formula that they have put on the field so far, you know, on offense? I mean, they, they get off to a slow start. They don't really come alive until the second half. It's, you got to play 60 minutes of football. And I, I just feel like the Giants are have been lucky more so than, you know, good. I mean, what, do you, what are your thoughts about how they've been getting these wins and can they sustain it? Well, Patty, sustainability for the way that the Giants are playing is something that I think we've all been talking about. I wrote about it on Monday at Big Blue View, as a matter of fact. And the issue is what we've seen from the Giants through eight games is control the pace of the game. And under an underappreciated stat that someone pointed out to me recently is that if you look at how long the Giants take to snap the ball on offense, they're taking more time than almost every team in the league to snap the ball. They're trying to slow the pace of the game down. They're trying to get through a game with as few plays run as possible. Mm -hmm. They're trying to run the football, you know, keep the score close, keep the score down, make the plays that they have to make, and rely on, you know, get the game to the fourth quarter and rely on, you know, capitalizing on a mistake. The problem is sometimes you're going to make that mistake. That's what happened against, you know, against Seattle. Against Dallas, when the Cowboys scored a couple times, the Giants didn't have the firepower to keep up late in the game. And when you play better teams, those teams, those mistakes aren't going to come as often. Those, those opportunities aren't going to come as often. The Giants' path to win is very narrow. You know, despite being six and two, they have to find a way to get to get more explosive plays, Patty, whether that's getting more out of Wandale Robinson in the offense in the second half of the year, whether that's finding a way to get the ball downfield in the passing game to Saquon a little bit more. They have to try to find ways to to make this a little easier on themselves. And I think that's the question we're all asking is whether it's sustainable or not. Maybe not to the level that we've seen it so far, but, uh, but I don't know if this edition of the giants has another path. Yeah. I, I'm not so sure at this point, because it is not a complete roster. Do you think though, you know, the six and two start, I think, has has made a lot of people happy and has surprised a lot of people. So, at the end of the year, what if you're Joe Shane? What criteria are you using to say, okay, 
this was a pretty good season. And, you know, record notwithstanding, let's throw the record out because it is what it is. But what criteria are you looking for to say that this season is headed in the, you know, means that this team is headed in the right direction? Well, I think, Patty, that the first thing, if you're the GM, the first thing you look at is do I have a foundation of talent that I can go forward with or do I need to gut this? We've all talked about this being an evaluation period. And Joe didn't completely gut this roster. He he kept a lot of the young talent. And I think we've started to see him talk about contract extensions for guys. And and I so I think the first thing you look at is do I have a core that I can go forward with? I think we can already answer that in the affirmative. I think there's a, you know, whether whether Daniel Jones is a long-term part of it or not, we still is still up for debate, but I think there are a lot of pieces here that you do go forward with. Did you make the right choice in hiring Brian Dayball as head coach? I think that's a resounding yes at this point. I think the the coaching staff that Dayball hired and the way that he has gone about letting them do their jobs tells you that that you should be able to go forward with with Dayball as your coach and with this coaching staff and and you should have some success. So I think you look at those two things really, you know, first and foremost is is do you have a core and do you have a coaching staff? And they of course do have a coaching staff. And let's talk about that coaching staff if we could for a minute here Ed because I think one of the biggest surprises for me at any rate besides the record is just how much this coaching staff has been able to get out of some of these guys. Now, you look at some of the players on, on the roster, and you've got some talent, you know, the Andrew Thomases, the Dexter Lawrences, but they've also picked up some mid-year guys, you know, guys off the scrap heap, if you will, that other teams didn't want, and they've been able to get stuff out of these guys. I mean, does that surprise you? Well, first and foremost, Patty, give credit to Joe Shane. Give credit to Assistant General Manager Brandon Brown, to the Pro Personnel Department. I think uh, Chris Rossetti, if I'm not mistaken, is in charge of, of that. And Rossetti and Brandon Brown are guys who uh, who Shane brought to the organization. Dennis Hickey, who I think is Assistant Director of Player Personnel, I think is another guy that, that he brought in. But give credit to that front office and the scouting department for going out and finding these players. I think Shane said the other day that according to to their data, no one has gotten more in terms of gameplay, in terms of snaps played. No one's gotten more out of in-season acquisitions than the Giants had. You've also got to give credit to, to coaches for quickly getting these guys up to speed, for getting these guys ready. It's a credit to the coaching staff. And, and as you were asking me the question, Patty, I was thinking about something. If you remember when Pat Shermer was head coach, you and I used to talk about this. We used to watch the Giants play and think, this is better than a four-win roster. Mm -hmm. This is better than what it's showing on the field. It's just not well coached. And sadly... I think we were fooled a little bit during the Joe Judge era as head coach. I thought initially that the Giants were coached better than they were. I think what came to pass with the with the Joe Judge reign was that he had a coaching staff full of college coaches. He had a coaching staff full of his buddies, mm. people that he had worked with before. You know, and I don't want to say he did favors to some of these guys, but I, I looked at some of the guys on the coaching staff and I wondered, you know, how is it that that guy has an NFL coaching job? Mm -hmm. And I think that in some of the confusion that we saw, in some of the bad situational football that we saw, in some of the inability to get personnel on the field, the inability to, to handle the last two minutes of the first half was... It, I think in some respects you go back and you pin that on the fact that you don't have an NFL coaching staff on the sideline. This is an experienced NFL coaching staff full of guys who have had success, full of guys who have done this before, full of guys who know what they're doing. 
and they're not always going to be right, Patty. They're going to make mistakes. But you you look at the preparation and, and the way things are going, and I think that coaching staff makes a huge difference. Hey, Giant fans, playing Daily Fantasy based on player projections has never been easier when you visit prizepicks.com. Pick two to five players, and if they go on to score more or less than their prize picks projections, you win up to 10 times the amount of your money on any entry. There's no competing against other people. It's just you versus the projections available. Prize Picks is currently operational in over 30 states and in Canada and offers projections on every sport. Entries can be made in 60 seconds or less, and Prize Picks offers safe and fast withdrawals. Download the Prize Picks app today or go to prizepicks.com to sign up and play daily fantasy sports. First time users can receive a 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with the promo code locked on. Don't forget to enter that promo code locked on at sign up at prizepicks.com. Let's talk about the defensive side of the ball. You know, we haven't really talked about them as much. Wink Martindale, you know, you, you look at how, what could have been, you know, it's interesting. There were reports, I think even Dable might have admitted to it when he was first hired, that Patrick Graham was a guy they wanted to retain. Patrick Graham, of course, went to the Raiders, where the Raiders are having all kinds of problems now, holding on, uh, you know, protecting leads and whatnot. The Giants hire Wink Martindale, and I think a lot of people, including myself, wondered how that dynamic was going to work, because Wink is an alpha male. You know, you figured Dable was an alpha male. How would that work? That marriage has worked beautifully and Wink has gotten really that defense playing at a high level. I mean, when you look at the job he has done, Ed, does that surprise you? No, the job Martindale has done hasn't necessarily surprised me, but I think that you have to back up for a second and give all sorts of kudos to Brian Dable. He's in his first year as a head coach. He waited a long time for this opportunity and what has he done with this coaching staff, Patty? He has gotten out of the way. Mm. He is being a head coach. I remember listening to Thomas McGahey in the spring. We're talking to T-Mac about Dable. And pretty much the first words out of T-Mac's mouth were, he trusts me. And, and I remember it just happened to be a day when I think it was it might have been OTAs or whatever. There was a special teams period going on on the field. Brian Dable was over on the sideline talking to us. He had his back to the field. He was over on the sideline, you know, flipping his whistle around on his finger like he does. Mm -hmm. But he's over. He's shooting the breeze with the reporters with his back to what's going on during the special teams period like t max got this. I can't add anything to the special teams. He's got this. I'm just going to go talk to these guys. And I'm like, you know, that's different. First of yeah. all, it's like, that's really different. But you look at the offense, Patty. Brian Dable made his living as a play caller. He got hired because of his play calling acumen. And what has he done? He has stepped back and allowed Mike Kafka to run this offense to it may not entirely be, you know, Kafka's playbook. It's largely Dable's playbook, but he has stepped back and allowed Mike Kafka to run the play to play offense to, to do all of that. And, and he hired on the defensive side, he hired Wink Martindale, who, as you said, is an alpha male really competitive, makes no bones about the fact that he wants to be a head coach. And what has he done? He's gotten out of the way and let Wink Martindale run the defense the way he wants to run it. And that's aggressive. And you know, the Giants have bought in. They play more man-to-man -man defense, I think, than any other team in the league at this point. But uh, for me, all the credit in the world to Dayball, especially as a a first-time, first-year head coach trying to establish himself that he's gotten out of the way and let his assistant coaches do their jobs. Yeah, and that's hard for some guys to do, especially first-time head coaches. We saw that with Joe Judge, who tend to 
tended to micromanage sometimes to the point where you were just sitting there going, hey, Joe, why'd you hire these guys if you're going to you know, do their job for you? So Dable came in certainly with the right mindset. And, you know, I had, um, I think it was uh, Sean King who talked about the difference between Dable and um, the, uh, you know, and, and Joe Judge, both coming from that Belichick tree. And uh, no, it was, I'm sorry, it wasn't Sean King. It was, um, gosh, now I forgot who it was, but I had a guest on a couple, a couple weeks ago. It'll come to me. And the difference is, is that Dable is comfortable in his skin. You know, he's, he's got Belichick qualities, but he's not a clone. He's, he's his own man. And, and that comfort level is what allows him to, you know, do what he needs to do, but also deviate from the Belichick way of doing things. So big difference there, obviously, in, mm -hmm. in how, uh, how he does things. And it was Ross Tucker, by the way. Shame on me. That's who, that's who made the comment. <laughs> there you go. Ross Tucker was the one. The there guest. you I, go. The, I've had the, so many guests on that, I, that I, you know, I'm forgetting who, who said what. But anyway. Um, the, the one, Patty, the one thing I'll say about that quickly is the one thing that Brian Dayball has done in his coaching career that Joe – and I like Joe. I think I Joe too. could. I think Joe, given time, given the willingness to sit back and reflect on what went wrong in New York, and and given the opportunity, maybe down the line to coach a college program or coach another team, I think Joe will be a very successful head coach one day. Yeah. I really do. I think he's very knowledgeable. But the one thing that Brian Dable has done in his career that Joe Judge has not done is actually gotten away from Bill Belichick. Yes. He's seen, he's been other places. He's seen how other organizations run. He's seen that, that, that there are other ways of doing things and other ways of communicating. And, and for me, the best thing that could ever happen to Joe, who's back in New England as an assistant coach, the best thing that could ever happen to Joe is if he gets away from Belichick for a while and sees some other ways of succeeding. Yeah. And that's, if you think about it, that's what did McAdoo win when he was mm -hmm. here. He, all he knew was Mike McCarthy. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that there, there's definitely some, some validity to that, to that point. Plus Dable has experienced, you know, adverse times you know joe i remember when he was talking about how at one point they all thought they were going to be fired and they still had a winning record it was like you don't know what adversity is if that's what you're basing it on right so that was that was a kind of a, a curious thing all right and moving forward what does this team do you think need to show that it hasn't shown in the first half of the season well if we're talking about specific things patty I think that they need to find a way to get more explosive plays on offense. They need to – Wandale Robinson, for example, averages 8.9 yards a catch. Mm -hmm. And I love the kid. I think the Giants love the kid. But they didn't bring him to the Giants to be an 8.9 yards per catch possession guy. They brought him to the Giants to be a guy that made explosive plays for them. And whether it's finding ways to get Wandale Robinson more into the open field, whether it's you taking more shots down the field with guys like Darius Slayton, they've got to find a way to get more explosive plays out of their passing game. I don't know if they can because they just don't have the big personnel. I think they have nine, Patty, which is last in the league in plays of 20 yards or more. Mm -hmm. And I think Baltimore, believe it or not, is second last, 31st in the league. And mm -hmm. Baltimore has 17, almost double what the Giants have. It just tells you how, how poorly the Giants have done in that category. And the other thing, if you're looking purely on the field, Sooner or later, Patty, the fact that the New York Giants defense, as good as it is, sooner or later, the fact that they cannot stop the run at all is going to destroy them in some of these games. They're trying to they're trying to control the pace of these games, and you can't consistently control the pace of games when you can't stop the run. Yeah, that's a big problem and, and surprising problem, all things considered, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean 
you could you could say, well, they were missing Leonard Williams for part of the early the early part of the season, but you know, even with Leonard in there, it's like you know what's going on. You know, are they maybe giving up the run to keep you know to focus on the pass? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know what it is either, Patty. But I don't <coughs> know if it's inside linebacker play. I don't know if it's because they're oftentimes only playing one true linebacker and that one true linebacker may not be all that great to begin with, but, but their run defense just hasn't been good enough. I mean, maybe we're nitpicking here because that's, it's not a perfect roster. It was never going to be a perfect roster, but those are the two areas that I look at. And I say, if, if, if it's going to continue this year, those are the areas that I really worry about. Yeah, I'm with you on that. And again, it's not a complete roster. Next year, the Giants will have a little bit healthier of a cap situation. They're projected to have 11 picks once the comp picks are awarded. Uh, Joe Shane, I, I feel confident in saying he'll get this, this straightened out. Uh, this year, very challenging for him. Managing the salary cap the way he's had to. And I put an article up on Giants Country about some of the things he's done. But um, I do believe, and Ed, you know, as a final thought, tell me if you disagree, that brighter skies are definitely ahead for this franchise. Oh, absolutely, Patty. I think that that we've seen enough to know that. I think we've seen enough to know that, that this is a talented front office. Now, they're going to make personnel mistakes. Everybody does. They're going to miss on a player every so often. That happens. But... But this, but you trust that Joe Shane has an idea that he has a plan, that he and Brian Dable are on the same page, and I think you look at Dable and that coaching staff, and 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 it's pretty clear that the two year cycle of Giants coaches is over with. That Brian Dable is going to be there for a while. As I said earlier, there's a there's a core of young players to go forward with, which the Giants need more. They need another couple of good drafts. They need another couple of good off seasons in free agency where they supplement this team with some pieces. You need to get lucky with a late round pick here and there. You know those kinds of things you you need to have happen. But but I think this this decade of of futility where the giants were a laughing stock i think you can you can be pretty sure that that's over with thank goodness and not a moment too soon for sure cuz it was <laughs> it was a rough decade i don't know if you were well you were alive during the uh the, the wilderness years i know i was i was a kid back then and but uh this this past decade kind of rivaled that Pretty close, a little but. mini wilderness years, Patty. Yeah, little, a little mini. Not quite as bad as that the, the original wilderness years, but you know, not fun no, either. So, no. all right, Edward, thank you as always for joining me on the Locked On Giants podcast. You, folks, you can check him out on Big Blue View. He also has his own podcast, Big Blue View Radio, and his own YouTube channel. So, uh, yes. He does have a YouTube channel, even though he's got a voice for radio or a face for radio. I think it is. Right? Oh, oh! <laughs> I had to get that in, and oh. it wouldn't be a sh- it wouldn't be a show if I didn't if I didn't do that. Come on, oh, we go back. Daddy. For those of you who don't know, Ed and I <laughs> used to be co-hosts here on the Locked On Giants podcast, but then he left me the bum. So I know I left you, Patty. I'm sorry, and, and and you're doing so horribly on your own. I know I am. It hasn't been the same. <laughs> <laughs> hasn't been the same oh. without you. But anyway, thank you folks for tuning in. We're going to try and do Twitter Tuesday tomorrow on Wednesday if I have enough questions. If not, I'll probably have uh, a different show for you. Thursday will be the uh, the crossover show. I'll have John Hickman of Locked On Texans. Friday we'll be doing the live show with Tana and the dog. Um, and also at some point I have an injury expert who's going to be on the show. We're going to talk about the Giants rash of injuries and how maybe they can proceed to kind of curtail some of this stuff. So that should all be interesting stuff. Keep it here on the Locked On Giants podcast for Ed Valentine. I'm Patricia Chana. Thank you, Giant fans. We'll talk to you tomorrow.